So uh, there we go. Thank you again, Doug, and uh, thank you to uh, Harry, and, and uh, uh, thank you all for, for being here. Um, so I'm not going to talk about everything that's on this table, um, but you can come and have a look later on. Uh, I know some of you have already uh, taken a look, so feel free. But I'll try and cover some of the, the, the things that I've done, some of the projects, um, particularly involving four-dimensional things. So first question, what is four-dimensional space? So, so if I were a physicist, then I might uh, be thinking of the fourth dimension as time. Um, but I'm not. I'm a, I'm a mathematician. I'm thinking of the fourth dimension as a fourth spatial dimension, a fourth dimension of space. So let's take a, a step back for a second first and, and think about three dimensions. How do we describe... Um, a point in three-dimensional space where we need three perpendicular axes, x, y, and z, and we say, if I want to talk about a point in space up here, then I'm, you know, so many meters to the right from the origin in the x direction, and so many meters forward, and so many meters up. And so to do four dimensions, well, I just add an extra perpendicular dimension, um, and a point in space is given by four uh, numbers. And because we've run out of Letters at the end of the alphabet, we'll add one on at the front, so we have W, X, Y, Z instead. And you might say, well, this is impossible. Um, you, you can't fit a fourth perpendicular direction into to what you already have. You know, this picture is a lie. Um, well, I should remind you, this picture is also a lie. Right? The, the, these are not three perpendicular lines. This is a flat screen. And these lines, you know, these, they look like right angles just because I've drawn them straight, but, you know, they're not. Um, so, so, you know, is, is, is this any more alive than this? And, and, well, in a sense, I'm going to argue, no, that this is, this is, they're just as much alive as each other. And we're perfectly happy with dealing with flat things that we think are three-dimensional, um, so we should be perfectly happy thinking with these other flat things that are four-dimensional. So we'll, we'll come back to this uh, in a second. So um, just as an example to think about what is, what is a, a four-dimensional object, let's, let's make a hypercube. And we're going to make this, we're going to start very simple, we're going to start with a point. So here's a point. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to move it uh, to the side a little bit, and then I'm going to draw a line connecting those two points, and I've made a line segment. And I'm going to do this again, I'm going to take a line segment, and another one that I've moved away in a perpendicular direction from the line that contains this line segment, and then I join the corners up and I've made a square. And I can do this again, I can move uh, take a copy of the square and move it in a perpendicular direction away from the first square, join it up to the corners and make a cube, and then just do it again. I just find some fourth perpendicular direction to move a copy of the cube and connect up all of the lines. So, so in a sense, that's what a, um, that's what a hypercube is. I mean, at least you know, well, I mean, it's a bit of a mess, but at least you know these corners are supposed to be connected to these corners and so on. But how do we sort of see this? I mean, you know, is, is this really a good picture of what's going on? How can we see four-dimensional things? And so um, the answer, I guess I'm sorry to tell you, is that we can't really see four-dimensional things. You know, the reason that we're okay with seeing three-dimensional things uh, pictured on screen is that we're very good. We're, we're evolved to understand what these two-dimensional images are, and we're evolved in a three-dimensional world. Um, and so the best that we can do for really understanding four-dimensional things is to look at various ways of squishing those four-dimensional things down a dimension into three dimensions so that we can actually see them and, and hopefully understand them. So, so here's, here's the sort of, here's the example which sort of starts this whole process. This is a three-dimensional object, this is a cube, and here is a shadow of that cube which has been squished down onto two dimensions. And so the idea, of course, is that um, now that it's down in two dimensions, uh, a two-dimensional person, so this goes back to, of course, the, uh, the ideas of, uh, of flatland. Um, if, you're, if you're a two-dimensional person and you're living in the plane here, yeah, let's, let's do this because we can. So here's a, this is a flashlight. You can take the top off and, and uh, let's see. So this, this is why, this is why you, you want to be uh, able to see things. You can see the shadow down on here. This is approximately the same as that picture up there. And so, so the idea is that a two-dimensional person can try and understand what, what's going on in this picture and try and understand this three-dimensional object even if they don't have any chance of, of understanding the three-dimensional object uh, in person, say. And so we're going to do the same thing going from four dimensions down to three dimensions. 
so, so this is actually an orthogonal projection of the cube. And what, what does that mean? So, uh, so if, I, if I hold the light far enough away, then roughly speaking, the light rays approaching the cube are parallel. So if you did this outside with the sun, then the light rays would be parallel. And so orthogonal meaning that the light rays that cast a shadow it's difficult to gest gesticulate when you're holding a light <laughs> and, uh, uh, and a, a, a transparent sheet of plastic, um, but uh, the light rays are parallel. And so, you know, this gives a sense of what's going on um, with this three-dimensional object, but it's not that great. I mean, there's some problems. So, so our two-dimensional friend might say, well, so it looks like these two lines sort of crash through each other. Is, is that really true? And he would say, well, no, actually, that's not true. Let's see. So I think, I think these, the, these two shadows here are of this, this edge and this edge here, and you can see the shadow of the top one going down through here. And you would say, no, that, that's not quite right. They, they don't actually crash through each other. In the real object, they're, they're separate from each other. Um, but there, there, are some good, there are some good features of this. So um, our two-dimensional friend can see that this edge and this edge are, are, are parallel. And that's true up here as well. The, the, the real uh, edges in three dimensions are also parallel. So, so there's some good features and some bad features, in particular this crashing through things. Um, so what else can you do? Um, well, you can say, let's do the same thing from uh, four dimensions down to three dimensions. This is an orthogonal projection of the hypercube, so I'll be handing many, many things around the audience so you can have a look at these things. Um, and you'll notice that it has some of the same properties, right? The, here, are some, here are two parallel lines, and those are really parallel in four, in four dimensions as well. Um, but there's still, well, so we've avoided the problem of edges crashing into each other, but we have other problems, right? I mean, this edge here is crashing through this face here, and, and that's not really a feature of the true uh, four-dimensional object. I should say this is, uh, um, this is uh, a piece called Hypercube B by Bathsheba Grossman. She's another um, mathematical artist who, who works uh, extensively in 3D printing. Um, okay, so that's orthogonal projection. What else can we do? Here's... Is let's do some perspective projection. So, uh, so perspective projection. What what you do is, I guess people people can't really see on top of this table, so I'll use I'll use the ground. So you 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 bring the light source close enough to the object that you get this uh, well this perspective view. Whoops, uh, <laughs> I'm a trained professional. Um, so, so, and why is, this, uh, why is this a perspective view? Well, so if you look at this thing, it looks sort of like what a photograph of a cube might lo look like. This is sort of an interesting uh, feature. And the, and the reason, or, you know, why is that true? Well, if you put your eyeball right at where the light source is, then what it would see of the cube is the same as, as what's being projected onto the ground. And so, so you're, you're seeing the, the, the same as a perspective uh, picture of, of the, the cube. Now... Um, so in this, in this picture over here, well, have we really improved things? Well, not really. We still have these, these edges crashing through each other, and now we don't even have parallel edges, so, so this isn't looking so good. Um, but here's something else we can do. So if we, if we move the light source directly over the top, now this looks, now this looks better, right? I've, all of my edges are, um, are disjoint. None of them are crashing into each other. So that looks, that looks much better. Um, in fact... I mean, it is better, but there's still some crashing going on. Now, now where is this crashing? So, so sure, none of the edges are intersecting each other. What's happening to the faces of the cube? So there are supposed to be six faces of the cube. Where are they? So there's one down here in the middle, corresponding to the bottom of the cube. And then there are these four around here, corresponding to the four sides. Where's, where's the sixth face? Where's the sixth face on the plane? It's, it's, it's covering over all of the other five faces. So we're not quite there in really showing that, you know, what's going on here. So, um, so we still have some crashing, although it's a little harder to see that all the faces are being covered by this, this top face. Well, okay, so this is still pretty good. Um, and it still, I think, gives a, maybe a cleaner sense of, of, of what's going on. Here's the, the four-dimensional, the perspective projection of, of a hypercube. And you can really see the, uh, the comparison. Well, you can really see what's going on a lot better. Um, you can see, for instance, here's one of the, you know, maybe this is the cube that I started with, and I translated, I took a copy which I translated to somewhere else of, of this cube, and then I connected up the corners. In which direction did I, did I translate this one? I, I translated it away from us, 
in four dimensions, which is why it looks smaller. It's smaller because it's further away from us. OK, um, so, so this is a, a couple of ways of, of doing this. Um, this still has the, the, the crashing problem again. Um, there are uh, eight cubes in the hypercube. Um, there's one in the middle here. There's six more arranged around it, four on the sides, one on the top, one on the bottom. And the eighth one, again, covers all of the other uh, seven. So, so we still have a little bit of crashing, but, um, but it's, a, it's a better, I would argue, it's a better way to see what's going on. What else can you do? Stereographic projection. So you've already seen, oh gosh, it's very dark. Um, can I find the right one? Here we go. Can I find my flashlight? Yes. Um, so stereographic projection, I would argue, is uh, the best way to do this. Um, so you've already seen this if you looked at the, uh, um, if you looked at the, the poster, but here's the idea. So I've got this uh, spherical pattern. Uh, and if I put my flashlight at just the right place, then this curvy grid pattern on the sphere maps onto, well, if I get it in the right place, hopefully something like a, a grid pattern on the ground. And so, well, really what this is showing is, yes, I chose the pattern on the sphere in such a way that it would uh, uh, project. It's sort of the inverse uh, map from the ground up to the sphere um, is whatever you, it needs to be so that the, um, the pattern on the ground recovers the grid. So, so what, is, uh, what is stereographic projection? It's a map from the sphere down onto the plane. And this, uh, and so what do you do? Um, you put a, a light source at the north pole of the sphere, actually on the sphere itself. And you draw lines from, from that light source uh, down onto, onto the plane. And that line hits the sphere in one place, and it hits the, the plane in one place, and that's the map. Whenever you hit the, plane, the sphere, uh, that point maps to where it goes on, on the plane. Um, and so, OK, how am I going to use this to, uh, to make a picture of the hypercube? Well, so again, we're going to look back in three dimensions and do the same thing in three dimensions, and then we're going to see how, how to apply that in four dimensions. So, so the first problem is that the cube isn't sitting on the sphere. And, I, and this map, stereographic projection, goes from, uh, goes from the sphere to the plane. But I can fix that by sort of blowing that up into a beach ball cube. So what am I doing? I'm, I'm sort of putting a light source at the center of the cube. This is what this photograph is supposed to show. So it's a little difficult to, to make out. Here's a cube that's sitting inside of a, a spherical uh, shell. And there's a light source at the center of the cube. And it's being projected out onto the shell. And it's, and it's producing these, these curves here. So I, I radially project this out onto, um, onto the sphere. And now I've got it on the sphere. Now I can do stereographic projection and get this picture here. So let's, uh, let's do that for real. So again, if I, if I get it in the right place, something like this. And now, now I claim that I fixed my problems. Well, OK, I, I've got other problems. Um, now all of my lines are curvy, which is a little bit weird. Um, but but I, fixed, I fixed my problem of having faces or edges crashing into each other. Because, OK, so again, where am I? So there, there are no edges that are crashing into each other. Where are my faces? I, I need to find six square faces. There's one in the middle. There's, there's four around here. Where's, where's the sixth face? Where's the sixth face? It's, it's outside. So, so what happens to points that are on the, the little patch of the sphere that's up top? You go from the light source out here. You, don't, you, you go above these edges, and you hit down here. So the sixth face is outside. And so this is, this is a map from uh, every point of the boundary of the cube gets to go onto, onto the, the plane. Actually, that's a slight lie. There's one point of the boundary of the cube that doesn't get to go onto the plane, which is the North Pole itself. So the North Pole itself somehow gets sent to infinitely far away on the plane. Here's another picture of that. Um, now some other, OK, so, so yes, there, there are curvy edges, which is not so great. But there are some other um, real advantages of this map, which you can maybe see here. 
So the angle here between two of these edges on the sphere is 120 degrees, because three of them are coming in at equal angles. And one of the amazing properties of stereographic projection is that it preserves angles. This angle here is also 120 degrees, and this angle here is 120 degrees. Um, the, the angles on the sphere are preserved on the plane. Um, and, okay, so great. And this is what happens when you uh, do the same thing in four dimensions, going from the, uh, the hypercube to the sphere in four-dimensional space, and then stereographically project to, to, to three-dimensional space. And this is what you get. And again, um, all eight of the cubes are present here. None of them are crashing into each other. There's nothing overlapping. <laughs> Um, it's a little hard to see here where, where the cubes are. Here's a, sometimes we have to go back to computer-generated imagery. 3D printing doesn't always uh, let us show everything we want to show. Here's another picture of the eight cubes. There's the one in the middle. Um, here's there's these uh, six of them arranged around the outside, and then the eighth one we're actually inside of. So we're inside of the eighth cube of the cube. Okay, so... Um, just because stereographic projection is so cool, I had to show you some more things. So um, let's see, let's do this one. So, so this is the, the same sort of idea um, as the square grid, but you can do it with a hexagonal grid instead. And uh, what else do we have? So um, let's look at this one. So this is... Uh, th these are uh, related to the symmetries of the dodecahedron, and uh, this is another good one for seeing how the, the angles are preserved. So um, on, this, on this object, you've got sort of uh, places where four triangles meet, and places where six triangles meet, and places where ten triangles meet. And so the angles there are, you know, 90 degrees and uh, 60, de 60 degrees and, well, whatever, whatever 360 divided by 10, I guess 36 degrees is. And, and those angles, you can measure them on the, on the floor as well, are preserved. Even though, you know, there's something very strange going on with uh, the distances. The distances get, are getting distorted, but the angles are not. Um, and just one more. This is, this is where, is, where is that one? Here it is. This is really... So the last one is a T-shirt? Yeah, that, that was uh, the same thing as, as what's on my T-shirt, yes. Um, so this is another one that shows a... Another amazing property. So, so on this object on the sphere, there's lots of circles. And they project to circles on the floor as well. So, so stereographic projection not only preserves angles, it also preserves circles. But what's strange about this is that it, it doesn't preserve the centers of the circles. So if you look, um, it's a little hard to see, and I can't point in anything because my hands are full. Um, but the, the larger circles on the outside, um, if you look at the sort of uh, five-pointed, uh, the pointy pentagon inside of that circle, it's very distorted. The center of the circle is not really near the, uh, um, the center of the pentagon. So, so it knows that circles need to go to circles, but it doesn't know where the centers go. It sort of forgets about this. It's a very strange uh, property of stereographic projection. Okay. So... Um, so I mentioned very briefly the sphere in four-dimensional space um, as I was zooming past talking about how to make this thing. But well, what does this mean? What do you mean the sphere in four-dimensional space? What is the sphere? So we, we can try and visualize this. Um, so again, what we always seem to do is sort of go back to three-dimensional space and then understand what's going on there and then, and then use that to, to understand by analogy in a sense what's going to happen in four-dimensional space. So what's a sphere? A sphere is the set of points that are at this uh, constant radius from some center. Um, and so in three dimensions, we've got, uh, here's another picture of, uh, of the sphere. It's this last one. Um, and just to prove <laughs> that, it's a, that it's a real thing, here we go. So. There we go. So, so you get this, this picture once again. Um, and if I balance this right, I can just leave it. Oop, maybe not. <laughs> Let's try that again. 
Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so, um, so what is this showing? Um, so, so this this pattern on here is actually the, the what you get if you if you project a, an octahedron rather than a cube. But um, but what I want to wanted to say about this is so. I've got this, this sphere here, which is divided into eight triangular panels. And so the, the stereographic projection of that is eight triangular panels on the plane as well. Now, on the plane, they look a little, little bit different. So these four in the middle are obviously the same as each other. But then you've got these very large ones on the outside. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is, if you look back up at the sphere, it's clear that these are the same. The, 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 the ones in the southern hemisphere are the same as the ones in the northern hemisphere. It's just that in the projection, they look different. So we do this one dimension up. Same thing again. What is the four-dimensional sphere? I can't show you the sphere, but I can show you the projection of it. And what it is is the whole of three-dimensional space plus the North Pole. So again, you don't get the North Pole, but you get everything else. And so three-dimensional space is divided up into these sort of curvy tetrahedra. And there are eight tetrahedra in here. This is the southern hyperhemisphere, or hemi-hypersphere, are these eight, tetra these eight tetrahedra in here, and then there are eight more on the outside, which go out to infinity, which are the same as the ones in the middle. If you don't believe me, just look over there again. They're really the same, um, and they're the ones in the northern hemi-hypersphere. So, so, the, the, so the, three, the, the sphere in four-dimensional space is the same as the whole of three-dimensional space plus a point. Okay, let's talk about uh, regular polytopes. So, so in, in, in two dimensions, the regular polytopes are the regular polygons. Everybody's very familiar with the triangle, the square, the pentagon, and so on. And there's infinitely many of these. And in three dimensions, there are only five. There's the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. Um, so, so what is a polytope? Well, roughly speaking, it's, it's a geometric space in, in some dimension. These are the three-dimensional guys. And it's got faces which are polytopes of the, the next dimension down. So the dodecahedron has 12 uh, pentagonal faces. And it's regular, which means that um, all of the faces are the same and all of the vertices are the same and everything sort of looks the same as, as everything else. There's, there's no sort of special point on, on the, the polytope. So these are the regular polyhedra. So, of course, you ask what, what's going to happen in four dimensions. Um, well, so we already talked about, in fact, I can give you the entire picture of all the poly regular polytopes in every single dimension. And it's quite simple. So we have one infinite family already, the polygons in two dimensions. There are three other infinite families, and here's what they are. We've already seen one of these families already. So this is, you take a point, you take a copy, and you move it uh, away in a perpendicular direction from a point. That's any direction. And you join them to the, together, and you get an edge. And then you copy, translate, join together. You get a square, a cube. This is the hyper U. And this continues on for every dimension. And then there are two other infinite families. So with this one, so well, let's start here. You start with an edge. You move one point away from the line containing this edge in a perpendicular direction. And then you connect the lines, and you get a triangle. This triangle sits in a plane. You take one point, you move it away from that triangle, from the plane of that triangle perpendicular, join the lines and you make a tetrahedron. And then after that, you get this thing, which is uh, sometimes called the pentachoron. This is the, the, the four-dimensional version of the tetrahedron. And this goes on, five dimensions, six dimensions, any dimension you want. And then there's one other. These are called the, the cross polytopes. And here the rule is, well, let's start here again. You've got this uh, line segment that's sitting inside of a line. You take two points, one either side of, of that line, and sort of connect up the lines, and you get a, a diamond, otherwise known as a square, if you turn your head 45 degrees. If you do the same thing again, you've got a plane which contains this square. Take two points, move them away from that plane in opposite directions, connect up the lines, you get an octahedron. And this is, this is called the, the 16 cell. This is another of the, the four-dimensional guys. And again, this sequence continues forever. And then there are exceptions. These are the only exceptions. In three dimensions, there's the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. And in four dimensions, there's the 24 cell, the 120 cell, and the 600 cell. So what are these names, by the way? The, these, so the 24 cell um, is referring to the number of cells, three-dimensional boundary things that this thing has. So in the same way as the dodecahedron, 
dodeca, 12. The dodecahedron has 12 faces. The 24 cell has 24 cells, and these are all octahedra. So the 24 cell is a very strange object, and I'm not going to talk about it, but here you go. You can play about with, uh, with that model of it. Um, and what else is going on here? You know, why, why do I have uh, these computer renders of this 120 cell and 600 cell? Well, first of all, 120, this has 120 dodecahedra inside of it. It's a lot of dodecahedra. And this one has 600 tetrahedra, tetrahedral faces. I mean, these are just enormous. In particular, it means that if you want to print it, it would have to be sort of this big and very expensive. Um, and instead, um, the thing to do is only print half of them. So what, what are these objects? This is the part of the 120 cell, which is in the southern hemihypersphere. All right? So, so, so you slice it in half. You only look at that bit in, in the bottom half, and this is what you get. It's still plenty complicated, um, but at least you can, you can make a picture of it. And this is the same thing done with uh, the 600 cell. So these are <laughs> very complicated things. Um, OK. So, so for the rest of the, the talk, I'm going to talk about two uh, different projects that I've done with, with different people, building sculptures, in this case puzzles, based on this four-dimensional geometry that we're casting shadows of into three-dimensional space. So this is, this is uh, joint work with uh, Saul Schleimer. So we're going to look at this 120 cell and try and understand what on earth is going on with it. So, um, so as I mentioned, the 120 cell has 120 dodecahedral cells. So, I mean, you can sort of see one of them here on the outside. There's this pentagon here, and then there's pentagons, uh, there's five pentagons around that, and then five more around that and one in the middle. So this, this is one of the 120 dodecahedra that are sitting inside of this thing. And it has some vast number of faces and edges and, and vertices. Um, so how do we understand how these dodecahedra fit together? How can we see what's going on? So one way to do this is you can look at the layers of dodecahedra around the dodecahedron that's sitting right at the South Pole. So here it is. You've got one central dodecahedron sitting at the South Pole. This is a sort of schematic picture of what's going on. Here's the light source at the North Pole of this sphere in four-dimensional space. And here's this one guy down here sitting, sitting at the bottom. And arranged around this are 12 dodecahedra. And you see them at an angle of uh, pi over 5, so a fifth of the way from the South Pole to the North Pole. There are 12 dodecahedra arranged around that. And then 20 around around the, these, and then 12 more, and then 30 at angle pi over 2. So this is, this is halfway. These 30 uh, blue dodecahedra are sitting on the equator. What's the equator in, for the sphere in four-dimensional space? The, the equator for the sphere in four-dimensional space is an ordinary sphere. So just as the equator for an ordinary sphere is a circle, the equator for a sphere in four-dimensional space is the ordinary sphere, the sphere in three-dimensional space. And so, so here we are halfway, we're on the equator, and there are 30 dodecahedra here. And then this pattern is mirrored in the other four, um, uh, the other four layers. So they, they go back out again. And if you add up all of those numbers, you do in, indeed get 120. So this, this is sort of how these dodecahedra are arranged inside of this, uh, this object. Um, here's another way to understand where the dodecahedra are. So you can make a ring of 10 dodecahedra inside of uh, the, the cells of the 120 cell. And here's what you do. You start in a dodecahedron, and you choose a, a face to, to exit that dodecahedron. And then you enter another dodecahedron, and you go through the opposite face of that dodecahedron, and you keep going. And you keep going around, and you get back to your start after you've visited 10 dodecahedra. So you, you can make a ring of 10 dodecahedra. And if you start sort of in a, in a neighboring dodecahedron and you go sort of in the same direction, then you, get, you find another ring of 10 dodecahedra that wraps around the first one. And you can keep wrapping. In fact, you can find five, do, uh, five rings of dodecahedra that wrap around this, this uh, central gray ring in here. And this is half of the 120 cell, because we found six rings of 10 dodecahedra each. Six times 10 is, is 60. Um, and we can, we can continue. This is half of it. Here's the other half. Here's the seventh ring, the eighth, 
the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh. And again, we're sitting inside of the twelfth one, so I haven't drawn that one in. And uh, okay, so 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 the the hundred and twenty cell is somehow it's sort of got a grain, if you like. It's fibered by these rings of dodecahedra. And so Saul and I wanted to 3D print this thing because that's what we do. Um, and uh, so we wanted to 3D print that, that central uh, gray ring together with these five that are around it. But we wanted them to be loose. We wanted to be able to see how they fit together. And so there's a problem when you're 3D printing things is that when you tell the computer what to do, you can't have, um, you can't have uh, uh, pieces that are intersecting each other or touching each other in the printer because they'll come out of the printer fused together. They won't be, they won't be loose. And in fact, we could only figure out how to arrange two of these outer rings around the central one so that they, they were loose. Well, and here it is. Um, so here's a start over here again. Here we go. So they fit together. This is, this is, uh, this is the central ring here. And then two of the outer rings fitting around it. And you can get them to go apart and go back together again. And so this is great, but, but we really wanted to print all five. And we wanted to see how to fit them together. So what do we do? We cheated. We said, well, OK, we can't seem to do this whole ring. But if we remove the four largest dodecahedra, then we can print this thing here separately. So then you don't have this problem with them crashing into each other. You can just separate them uh, in the printer and, and make them, and everything will work fine. And we call this a rib because it's sort of gently curving and made out of dodecahedra, um, just like ribs are, apparently. Um, so, OK, uh, and now we can do this. And so now three, four, five uh, ribs fit together. Let's remove the central ring. We don't actually need it anymore. And we've got this object here, and, and we sort of inadvertently made a puzzle. Uh, because what you have to do is uh, start with, you know, it comes out of the printer as five separate pieces, and then you have to figure out how to put it together to make this thing here. Um, and so solving the puzzle is not that easy, but unsolving it is quite a lot easier. So there you go. Um, and so, right, so, so we, we, we inadvertently made a puzzle. Oh, this, this, and so this is sort of interesting. Well, let's try something else. Um, so what if instead we start with um, uh, shorter ribs, so we've got one sort of central axis and then uh, five sort of short little ribs curving around there, and another five curving around there. And they make this, this object, which sort of has this dodecahedral symmetry to it. So we call this the, the DC45 Meteor puzzle. These 11 pieces can be put together to, to, to form this, this object here. Um, what we ended up doing in the end, uh, we decided on, on having these six different kinds of, of ribs, these way that we cut these rings up uh, into these six different kinds of pieces. And these make uh, many, many different puzzles. We were actually very surprised at uh, uh, how many different things there, there are that you can make. Uh, now, here, here's a little puzzle for you. Um, two of these are photographs of the same object seen from different directions. Which two are they? You knew I was going to ask this question. Have any ideas? Any guesses? They're going to be wrong, but you can guess anyway. <laughs> one, one, and two, four. One, one, and two, four. Yeah, close, but, but no. Um, this one's got a hole in the middle, and this one doesn't. Yeah, it, it's essentially impossible. Um, so, so, in fact, I lied. There were two pairs. Um, this is the same as this, and this is the same as this. So, so I'll show you, well, maybe I'll show you these two. So, so this picture up here, if I, if I hold this, so I sort of have to look around at you. You see this triangular... Uh, shape with the hole in the middle. Yeah, everybody buy that. That's that's this one up here, and then if I just rotate it slightly like this, then it, then I see the the square cross shape. So so, I guess let me I'll hand this one around as well. Um, so the moral of this story is, photographs are useless, right? I mean, you you, you show people these things, they don't even know they're the same thing. Um, so so you, you have to make video, or really what you have to do is experience it yourself with the physical object. And so absolutely, after, after, after the talk's done, come up and have a go at some of these puzzles and, and, uh, um, and see if you can figure them out and, and understand the shapes physically. Okay, let's move on. Uh, it's a second project. 
This is joint work with Thy Heart, who some of you may be familiar with, um, and my brother Will Sagerman. This is a sculpture called More Fun Than a Hypercube of Monkeys. Um, and so to get into this, I, uh, first I have to talk about symmetry. So, um, so what is symmetry? What is a symmetry of an object? So a symmetry of an object is a motion that leaves it looking the same. So I've got this, this picture over here. So what are some ways in which I can move this object so that it looks the same after I've moved it? And if you're a mathematician and this is obvious, then you can shut up. Uh, yeah, over there? By how much? How much can I rotate it by? So if I just rotate it by like 40, if I rotate it by 90 degrees, it's going to look different. So I have, to, I have to choose carefully how much I rotate it by. So how much do I want to do? Well, there's five of them. 72 degrees. 70 is right. So, so a fifth of a turn, or two fifths of a turn, or three fifths of a turn, or fifths of a turn, four fifths of a turn. And we also count do nothing. Do nothing is always, we always count as a thing you can do or not do, um, which makes it look the same. And, and so there's, there's all sorts of interesting um, stuff going on here. This is, this is the start of uh, group theory. Um, so one way to think about these symmetries can be added together. So if you do one and then the other, then you've sort of found the sum of two symmetries. So if I rotate, rotate by two fifths and then say rotate by two fifths again, that's the same as one of these other symmetries rotating by four fifths. And this is also why you need to add in do nothing, because rotating by two fifths and then rotating by three fifths means that you haven't done anything. Um, here's another example. So, so how many symmetries does this have? What are they? What can I do with this? Anybody, shout out. Reflections. I've got reflections, I've got rotations. So, so with this one, I can rotate the whole picture by 90 degrees or 180 degrees or 270 degrees but I've also got some reflections. So, so I've got four reflections. I can reflect along these, these four different, different lines and I get um, a different picture. OK, so now we know what uh, symmetries are. Now we're finally going to get to play with these monkey blocks. So let me turn these, these lights on. So, so I'd like you to get together with, uh, with your neighbors. And here's, here's, here's the question just for the next five minutes to think about. How can these monkey blocks fit together? So, so when I fit, to, fit them together, the, the faces have to match, right? So, so you're not allowed, and be careful, because some of them look sort of similar to each other, but they're not quite the same. So the, the, there are two monkey faces. One has the tongue sticking out to the left, and the other has the tongue sticking out to the right. And, you're not, and you have to match them up so that those pictures match each other. So get together with your neighbors. Do we have some spare, spare monkey blocks? Let's, let's get, them all, get them all out, and let's see how they can how can you match them together? And how big of a structure can you build with these things? Well, so, so when you put them together, they have to, they have to be in identical positions, right? So, so the two faces have to be the same when you put them together. So, so, yeah, what about, uh, let's get some more of these. <laughs> See what you can do with these. If you, don't, if you don't have at least five of them in your group, come and get some more. So the rotation is important as well. 
right? When, when you put the two faces together, so, so the left, the, there's a left paw and a, and a right paw, and they have to match like this when you put them together. This reminds me of childhood playing with blocks. We should get some kids in here. Okay, so that, that, that worked. What I'm trying to think of is there a way you can get like four of our everything that's matching. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know. I've never done this before. It's not possible. They said it wasn't possible for me to have a picture of the picture. You can make a line. You can make a line as long as it's another Wait, no. Well, oh, yeah. So this is, this would be this, and that's up. Oh, wait, yeah, well, yeah, well. Because this, this goes like this, and that's going down and up, so it won't. And this is going down and up, so it won't. Oh, wait. Because they're all faces. They're all the same. They're all the same faces. And then for each of these. Yep, and then come back around. So everything is going to have a hole in it. So then when you go up, so when you go up, you have a space here, and then yeah, and then a space in the middle here. So it's just going to, it's, so you can go infinitely out. All right, maybe maybe we should, uh, maybe let's uh, let's get started again. Now, now that we've had to play with them and thought about how these can fit together. Oh, that's looking pretty good. Okay, I'm going to turn the lights off again, so... So, uh, take your seats again, maybe. So, some of you, so I, people probably saw that you can, uh, you can fit them together into a long line, right? You can do that as much as you want. And so, before we think about how we can uh, fit more of them together on this line, let's first think, what are the symmetries of this infinite line of blocks? So, so I'm thinking of this extending as far as I want in both directions. What can I do? So, so I can't just rotate the line in place. Right? If I just rotate the line in place, then this, uh, this is a tail, by the way. This is a face. So if I just rotate it by a quarter of a turn, it won't look the same. And if you rotate it by 180 degrees, it won't look the same. So none of that will work. But is there something that I can do, something else I can do? If I, I'm allowed to translate. I'm allowed to move this because it's an infinite line. What else can I do? I can move it four forwards. So if I go forward four, it's the same. So yes, I, so I can translate by four along. So that's a, that's a symmetry of this thing. There's, a, there's another symmetry. Do nothing. Do nothing, yes. We can always do nothing. Very good. <laughs> but another, another symmetry. What can I? Yes, OK. I can move it forward eight as well. I want something new. Can you, can you flip it over? Can you uh, flip it over? I don't way. think that works because. Turn it inside out. Oh, ooh, we're getting inventive now. <laughs> all right, all right. What about something that involves rotation and translation? Reflection. So, so oh, the, okay. the, monkey, the, the block itself it. has no oh, symmetries okay. other than... So I can do a screw motion, right? So what I can do is I can move it one this direction, and then I can do a left-hand screw by 90 degrees, and then it's the same. All right? And, of course, I can do that forward... To, to the left and left screw by two, so I can do two forward and 180 degrees, or I can do three forward and 270 degrees, or I can go forward by four. Great. Okay, so, so I can go forward by four, so really what I want to be able to do is, is forget about that going forward by four and make this not an infinite line anymore, but, but a circle of four blocks. And I still, and so, so if I sort of arrange them like this, then I can still think of, well, I can still sort of Instead of translation, now I'm moving around the circle. 
and I'm also twisting as I go, right? So, so if I sort of, if I say, well, let's, let's forget about the fact that I want them to fit together in three-dimensional space, because this is a talk about four dimensions, and you knew it was coming, um, then this arrangement of uh, this ring of four blocks, it has um, symmetries which are rotation along here, this is like translation, plus a left-hand screw. And in fact, those, those four things are the only symmetries of that ring of four blocks. And so you can go into the third dimension in some ways. This works. You can stack these things up. And, and I saw some people trying to stack these up in planes, and you run into problems. You've got holes. But this face looks like it wants to glue to that face, and this face like, looks like it wants to glue to that face. If only you could fit three cubes around each edge, then everything would be very happy. Like they are here. In this picture of the hypercube, I've got three cubes arranged around each edge. And in fact, I can glue this thing up to make the hypercube. Well, I mean, OK, I can't do it in three-dimensional space. But if, you, if you'll give me the leeway to say, I'm really going to curve this around in the fourth dimension, then I can do this. Uh, so eight monkey blocks together glue together to make the cells of a hypercube. Now, OK, so we talked a little bit about the symmetries of a line of these cubes and of a ring of these cubes. What are the symmetries of this hypercube that's patterned in this way? Um, well, <laughs> this is what's going on. Um, so so here's, the, here's this ring of cubes around here, and I've got this, this yellow and orange arrow. This is the face, the monkey face uh, uh, circle. And if you go around here, then you're rotating around here and left twisting. And if at the same time you're following this yellow, yellow red arrow, you're, you're going up this way, you're going around this circle, and you're also rotating, so you're doing this left-handed screw motion. So that's one of the symmetries. Amazingly, there's three others. So if you go in this direction, so here's a circle of, of uh, here's a ring of four blocks, and you can go forwards and, and, and do your left-handed twist. And at the same time, uh, the other four blocks, where are they? They're here. These four are also following the purple arrow, doing the forward left-hand twist. And in the j direction, here we go. Why am I calling these i, j, and k? Well, some of you already know. Um, there's another ring of four blocks here, which you can go forward and twist, and all of these are symmetries of of this decorated hypercube. And these are the only symmetries of this decorated hypercube. So I'm just going to get very slightly technical, because I'm very near the end of the talk. Um, so there are eight symmetries of this decorated hypercube. And these correspond to the eight elements of the quaternion group. So here it is. I've written it down. It's got eight things in it. 1 i, j, k, minus 1, minus i, minus j, and minus k. And what are these different symmetries? So one is do nothing. We always have that symmetry. And then there are these sort of screw motions in the i, j, and k directions. So I've got the i direction here, the j direction here, and the k direction around here. Minus i, minus j, and minus k are the reverse ones. So instead of doing a left-handed twist forward, what is the reverse of, a, of, of this thing? It's, it's sort of hard to imagine. If you think about it, what, is, what, is, what happens when you do a left-handed twist backwards? you do a left-handed twist in the other direction. You don't get a right-handed twist. And minus 1 sends every cube, cube to its opposite. And you actually use this, this picture as a map of, of how these combine together. You, know, you can add together these symmetries to give other symmetries. And so, uh, well, for those in the know, you should know that uh, i squared should be the same as minus 1. And if you sort of start here and follow the i arrow twice, then you get to the opposite cube, which is the same thing as doing minus 1. And uh, what else should be true? i then j then k should also be minus 1. So if you do i and then j and then k, then you're opposite where you started. So again, that's the same as minus 1. And these satisfy these, these equations, which are the equations of the quaternion group. OK, and so this is all very nice. And now we want to make a sculpture out of this, which has this symmetry. Um, so each monkey block itself has no symmetry itself. So even though you know, it looks like the top face, face, and the bottom face, face, are the same. This is a tail face, this is a tail face, this is a paw face, that's a paw face, and so this is a face face, and this is a face face. Um, so they look the same, but there's, no, there's actually no way to rotate it or reflect it in order to get this face face to look, to, to be in that face face. So, so this only has the do-nothing symmetry. Um, 
So how do we make a sculpture which has this bizarre symmetry group, this four-dimensional symmetry group? What we have to do is we have to put a design with no symmetry into a cube. Here we go. This is a monkey. Monkeys sometimes have some symmetry. They have a bilateral symmetry along, along the, you know, a mirror symmetry across their faces. But I've sort of, and in fact, my brother arranged this monkey so that he doesn't have that symmetry. And then we have to put copies of, of this monkey into the other seven cubes. Here, here are his, uh, his neighbors. And these are arranged in the same way so that the, in the same way that these monkey block, block cubes match up with each other. So notice that, that this guy, when I move from, from this guy to the next guy over here, I'm doing this left-handed twist again. So if I go back to this picture, you can see this hand here is a right hand. And then to get to this hand on the back, I have to do a left twist to get to the back one. So this is really the same symmetries as these monkey blocks have. And, well, here we go. I mean, again, I can't show you the, the intermediate pictures of what we're doing in four dimensions. I can only show the result. Think of these cubes that we had as cells of the hypercube in four-dimensional space. And once again, radially project that out onto the boundary of, of the sphere in four-dimensional space, and then stereographically project it into three-dimensional space. And this is what you get. Um, this... Uh, Somewhat scary, some people say, arrangement of eight <laughs> monkeys somehow grabbing onto each other in all kinds of different ways. So I'll hand this around as well. Oh, um, let me just finish with something that's maybe even more scary. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, is a, this is an animation of these monkeys twisting through space. This is, this is a, a four-dimensional rotation um, that's... Uh, I guess guiding the acrobatics of these eight monkeys that are twisting around inside of, uh, uh, of four-dimensional space. So let's see what's happening here. Um, this monkey here is traveling in the direction of, let, let's call this the, the, the K direction. And as he's going up, he's, he's left twisting upwards and around. And these, these other monkeys, um, they're also left twisting, but for reasons that are sort of complicated. And I'm not sure I fully understand either. Uh, myself yet, these guys are going downwards as they left twist around. So anyway, uh, that's my talk. Thank you very much. I guess are there any questions? Yeah. In the animation we saw at the end, uh -huh. Does every monkey wind up in every position? No, um, there are two different rings. Two rings. So, right, there's this ring of four monkeys. Let's just leave this going for a while, why don't we? Um, there's a ring of four monkeys going around here, and they're going upwards. And then there's another ring of four monkeys that are going around here, and they're going downwards. And, and so they, they, don't, uh, they don't meet each other. So. Um, so, that, so in some sense, this is like if you only do multiplication by i, then where do you... So if you start at 1, then you go to i, minus 1, minus, one, minus i, and then back to 1. So you, you get a ring of four of them. And meanwhile, j and k and minus j and minus k are uh, rotating around themselves. But you don't get to swap between those two. But if you do, an, if you do a j or you do a k, then you, then you start swapping between these different rings. Yeah. Another question? Could you say a bit about uh, how you go from uh, one of these visualizations that you conceived of to what you actually have to do to get to these a physical object? Physical objects you have. Well, so, so, so I'm going to start with this as as a file on a computer, a three-dimensional file, and how does it actually? What do I actually have to do? Well, what I actually have to do is, I mean, there's there's some there's quite a bit of craft involved in taking, um, you know, a three-dimensional file and making sure that it's it's good to be 3D printed. Um, and then what I do once I've done that is I upload it to, to this website, this is a service where they will 3D print things for me so I don't have to do all of the hard work of doing that. Um, I mean, I can tell you a little bit about how that process actually works. Um, so so they, they receive my, my 3D file um, and they send it to the, the 3D printers. There's a few different technologies for doing 3D printing. Um, the, the, way that, uh, the way that these, these objects that I've 
uh, that I work with, um, that that technology, the way that it works is you, you have a machine, it has a, a, a tank, um, and it lays down a very thin layer of, of uh, plastic dust. This is actually made out of nylon. And the whole tank is heated to just below the melting point of the plastic. And then a laser comes along and it zaps uh, the dust where it wants it to be solid. And so it melts a little bit and sort of tacks onto its neighbors. And then it puts down another layer of dust and zaps it again, and another layer of dust and zaps it again. And so you're always working on the top of, of, uh, um, of the object that you're trying to build, and everything is supported in, in either the unused material or the things that you've already made. And at the end, you've got this solid block of dust, and you hoover away all the stuff that you don't want, and you, and you gradually excavate uh, out the object that, that you want to be printed. And, and then, they, then they send it to me via USPS or something. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so have you tried doing, you, you gave a very clear procedure to make these, this, this shape. Right. Have you done it with other things besides monkeys? Um, well, monkeys are the only possible choice. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I'm deadly serious, in fact. I mean, OK, so I didn't mention this. So I've got to put a design in here which has no symmetry. Right, so, so you know, it's not going to be some symmetrical object. It, can, it must have no symmetry, because if it had symmetry, then the object that I would produce had, would have more symmetry than, than the group that I'm trying to show. Oh, by the way, as far as I'm aware, this is, this is the first sculpture in the existence of the planet which has had this symmetry. Um, nobody's done this before. Right? So, so you know, th things with... Uh, I, and the reason is because you have to use four dimensions. So this symmetry group doesn't exist as a symmetry group of something in three dimensions. It doesn't exist. And so you have to go to four dimensions and then represent it somehow with some distortions, um, which I'm hoping that you'll give me. Um, anyway, so, okay. so, so why does it have to be a monkey? So it can't have any symmetry. So it's not going to be some mathematical figure. It has to be something. So, well, we might as well choose something figurative, because why not? It's not like I do that much figurative stuff. I thought it would be nice for a change. And then I need something that connects through the six faces of a cube onto its neighbors. Because if I'm going to 3D print it, it's got to be connected. So I need some figure that has six limbs, including the head. The monkey is the obvious choice, and so there you go. It had to be a monkey. <laughs> well, monkeys are mad. Right. There's actually a lot of monkeys in mathematical art. If you, if you go to the Museum of Mathematics in New York, there's quite a few things that involve monkeys. It, I think it's a theme. All right, if there's no more questions, then thanks again. Oh, let's uh, uh, give uh, uh, Dr. Henry Sinkerman another round of uh, applause.